Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. All righty, amen. Great ministry, and uh, you missed Laurel. She was here in the first service, and Cedric's been home with sick kids, so he's a good dad. But either way, we value their ministry. Hey, another thing uh, that we have going on at Sand Hills that I just thought I'd make you aware of is tomorrow night we have a prayer night, and we've been doing this once a month. And uh, so tomorrow night from 7 to 8 here at the church, if you'd like to come, just join us. Our elders lead us in a time of prayer, uh, normally for uh, our church, our city, our country, our nation, uh, the world, all that kind of stuff. We'd love to have you be a part of that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. All right, um, as we go into the message today, so, you know, my wife and I like to watch TV. We like all sorts of shows. I'm sure you guys love TV, get your own shows. You, you kind of, I think as a couple, you kind of develop your style together. Michelle and I figured it out. We, we kind of like, I like funny stuff. Uh, she likes more serious stuff. We kind of combine the two of those. And so if we can find any kind of, you know, comedic relief uh, in like a crime show or something like that, we kind of like that stuff. Although Lego Masters, honestly, has been really interesting to me lately. We've been pounding our way through that. That's been fun. Um, but, you know, in the midst of this, you get stuck with the commercials. Even when you pay for some of these services, you get commercials. Because I don't want to pay so much that I can skip the commercials. So I'll deal with the commercials. And so uh, you get these commercials. And every now and then, you'll get this commercial that goes on. And you're watching it. And, you know, like five seconds in, 10 seconds in, 15 seconds in. I'm sitting there going... I have no idea what this commercial is about. It must be a perfume commercial. Um, because that's how the fragrance commercials work, right? They, they do this thing, and if I ever see like Natalie Portman or Johnny Depp, uh, or just there's a style of person that'll show up, and they're saying something bizarre, they're in a weird setting, maybe France, probably France, and you're just like, yeah, it's a perfume commercial. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And there's a part of me that goes, who writes these? Like, what's the, what's the point of these? And I'm sure, I am sure they have one. I'm, the, I, I, I'm sure if I went and talked to an executive who does these perfume commercials, he would say, well, Here's what we do. Uh, we're trying to tap into these, these deeper desires and needs. I'm like, it would be something. But here's the thing. It just doesn't work for me. It does not connect with me. Now, to be fair, I'm probably not the target market. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's probably not for me anyway. So I get that. Um, but, you know, I've thought about this. So, I, like, there are times when, uh, there's a, a biblical connection, if you will. The biblical connection for me is this, is that there are times when you study the scripture or maybe even hear something taught from the scripture and you're like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Like, I, I just don't get it. And what we do in scripture, just like on a commercial, you'll be reading through scripture, you get to this portion, and you're like, I'll just keep reading. I feel like, I don't get that part, I'm just gonna go on and we'll just let that go. And that's how the, the TV commercial is. You watch TV, it's over, you're like, I didn't get that commercial, good thing we're back to the show. And so I think sometimes in scripture. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause and we're gonna try to make sense of something that doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and I would even say this, that when we first read through this, you may think, okay, I think that makes sense. And then I want to tell you why I think it doesn't make sense. And then hopefully you'll get to the point where you're like, yeah, I'm not sure that does make sense. And then we're going to talk about why it makes sense. All right, so uh, welcome to your perfume commercial of the day. So if you will, um, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12, going up uh, to Mark chapter 12. And let me read for us this passage. And it's, it's very short, Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said... How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. All right, so let me bring you back up to speed for context. So we are in the last week of Jesus' life. Normally what you would talk about prior to Easter, so this is that moment. We're probably on Tuesday. Tuesday, Jesus is walking around the temple courts, and over the past uh, few months, actually, we've been talking about this buildup and where we are, that he's in Jerusalem. It's the time of Passover. The time of Passover in Jerusalem, historically, even to this day, but historically, masses of people turned out. And when I say masses of people, I mean, I, I hope I've articulated this before. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of people, if not a million or more people are in Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this time, and this is Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, much different setup and smaller than it is today. And so there are people everywhere. And Jesus is at the temple complex. The temple complex is the event. That's what you're going for. Um, and there's this, uh, it's divided into sections, but the biggest section everybody can get to is the court of Gentiles. That's probably where Jesus is walking around the court of Gentiles. We know his disciples are with him. Other people that would consider themselves his disciples are with him. A crowd of people that are not his disciples are with him just to hear him talk. And then he is being confronted at, at every step by Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. He's got all these people coming to him and they're all 
battling him. And one by one, they're asking him questions and he is shutting them down with the most brilliant responses. I mean, he, he turns the questions around. He, he answers things they didn't even know they were asking. I mean, he is brilliant in the way that he does it. So much so that by the time you get to the passage right before this, so we're still in Mark chapter 12, but go back to verse 34 where he's wrapping up a conversation and we see this. And when Jesus saw that he answered him wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. No one, I love the word dared. Like nobody's going to risk it. Like, yeah, it's like they are almost over the, you know, like, should we ask him another one? Like, what are you, are you crazy? Like he, every time he shuts us down, don't ask him, don't talk to him, don't even look at him. Just stay over here, we'll stay in our group. And so that's what they're doing. Right now, as Jesus, as we're going to encounter him in this passage, right now, there's a group of Pharisees that had previously probably been interacting with him and they have pulled aside and they're just, they're their own group right now. But they're in that area. They're right there in that area. So they've gotten to the point where we're not going to talk to him. He's not going to talk to us. Don't look at him. Let's just drive on. And so Matthew now sets up something for us. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 and 42, we'll put it up here. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, all right, so the Pharisees are gathered together, meaning Jesus is still there, got his boys there, the crowd is there, people are watching, Pharisees stand over here in a the corner, there's a group of them, we don't have any, there's a group of them. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. All right, now we've got to pause here. This is good stuff. This is really good stuff. I mean, it is. This whole idea that like, don't talk to me. Every time we do, he just embarrasses us. He shuts us down. And so they've got this sense, I think, of which, you know, like, okay, well, at least we're done with that. We'll figure out some other way to get him. They're off doing their thing. And now it just seems like there's calm. And Jesus says, hey, guys. And you know, you, here's the thing. The crowds love the interaction. They love to hear Jesus talk to these guys. It is just like, they don't have TV, right? This is, this is it for them. And they've come and they, they're seeking the Lord. This guy's brilliant. Their verbal sparring is going on. It is, it is good stuff. This is entertainment as, as well as theology. And so they're digging it. And so when Jesus goes, hey guys, like the whole crowd would have been like, shh. Like everybody gets quiet. And Jesus goes, let me ask you a question. And you could almost hear 2,000 years later a collective sigh. Like, oh. All right, so he, he gives them a question which sounds like a softball question. All right, so Jesus asks them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And so they said to him, okay. I mean, I almost wonder if they, like, okay, hold what are we going to say, what are we, is it still David? I don't even know anymore. You know, like, so you get to the thing, like, all right. It's David, right? So, like, so that's that's where going, they're going back to, and so that's the setup to this. And I just think it's fun. So, since Matthew talked about it, let us talk about it. And then the idea and what Jesus says to them. Let's read a little bit here in verse thirty-five. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, "How can the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of David?" What Jesus is asking is, "Does this make sense? That the Christ is the Son of David? Does that make sense?" All right, so let's, listen, let's get some context from their perspective before we unpack that. Now, for them, if you were to ask them about Messiah, they had a thought about Messiah, they had a thought about this Davidic descendant, uh, they knew that there was a promise made to David that was enduring, this enduring ruler that was going to come as part of what they would have known as the Davidic covenant. And for us, we're going to pull it up here, it'll be in uh, 2 Samuel. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you see this. Uh, this is God speaking to King David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, right, when you die... I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. All right, the throne of his kingdom forever. Now they knew that wasn't Solomon. That wasn't any of the descendants of the line of David, the line of kings. It was not, this is, this is different. This is some transcendent person. This is going to be some other type of person. So Israel did expect a physical ruler, but this they knew was prophetic. And it was going to have some sort of unique fulfillment. Because David did have other descendants, but this future one, this is going to be different. Now, the people knew that, and so it's already worked itself into the way they think about the coming uh, king that, 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 you know, God had promised through David. And so even when Jesus was coming at the triumphal entry, and this was in the previous chapter of Mark, even during the triumphal entry, he's riding in on the, on the donkey, and there's, there's palm branches on the road, and the people are shouting, and this is the scene we see in Mark chapter 11. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. 
So very much so. Like this, the, the Hosanna word, it, it's a, a de- declaration of salvation or it means salvation is coming or, or, or Lord, bring us salvation. And then here we have it right here. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father, David. So they, they literally are expecting Jesus to do what they want him to do. Now, pause here. The idea of Jesus doing what we want him to do is something we wrestle with as well, right? We always want Jesus to do for us what we want him to do. And when he doesn't, we get frustrated too. But for them, they expected a deliverer who was gonna conquer Rome, who was gonna conquer the world, and he was gonna set up a kingdom of Israel that went to the ends of the earth, right? Everybody was gonna be ruled by our descendant of David who sits on the throne forever and ever, amen. That's what they expected. Which, by the way, is why when Jesus died, even though he resurrected, when he died, the Jews were out. They're like, no, this, this is not who we expected because when Jesus doesn't turn out to be who they expected him to be, they just bail on the whole thing. All right, so now the, uh, the Lord, Jesus is gonna unpack this for us. Uh, so as Jesus taught in the temple, back to verse 35, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit, key words, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? All right, now this is good. All right, so um, this is is one of those things where, first of all, Jesus is quoting scripture. He quotes Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. In fact, if you're taking notes today, you should put down, read Psalm 110 this week. But here's what you're gonna do if you read Psalm 110. I know, because I've read it. Uh, You're gonna go, you're gonna read Psalm 110, and you're gonna be like, "Uh uh-huh. Yes, good, good. And if I were to ask you afterwards, do you know what you just read? You'd say, I, I don't really know what I just, I got, this is what, you know what you read? No, not really. So, okay, the thing, this is why, by the way, I love a good study Bible. A good study Bible is beneficial to you. Uh, I think I've said in here before, I love the ESV uh, study Bible, although the Christian standard is good as well. But uh, in my ESV study Bible, it makes a, a, a great summary statement about Psalm 110. It says this, this is a royal psalm. The theme deals with the role of the house of David in the life of God's people. However, the scope goes beyond that of a human king. I love it, just a great summary. Royal Psalm. So here's the thing. This this psalm was believed by the Jews to be a messianic psalm, that this was a promise of that coming future king. And the the unique thing about this is it's a mention of a king who will also be a priest. Okay, that's, that's a unique role. That's a unique role. So this is both a a physical earthly ruler, but one with a divine uh, uh, connection with God who is gonna represent the Lord in some unique way as he rules his people. That's new for them. And so this goes beyond the scope then of a human king. Um, And and then this idea here that that in the Holy Spirit, David wrote this, which Jesus is saying, so obviously it's true. (laughs) So when he's talking about this, he's saying, David was writing something even he didn't fully understand. So as he's writing this, even David doesn't really get uh, what's going on here. He's writing prophetically. So, but we have to unpack this a bit because there's a bit of a disservice done to us by our English language. Um, That is that we're missing nuances of the word Lord. So when it says, the Lord said to my Lord, there's two different words being used there. The first Lord is a reference to Yahweh. So Yahweh says, and the next one was just a, a, a lower sense, if you will, of a sovereign over you, your king, your, your, your ruler. So the, the king who's God says to my king, who's not of the divine nature, more of a man nature, says to him that, so that's where this starts off. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Okay, so all sorts of things going on here. So we got different Lord words being used here. Sit at my right hand. Okay, so sitting, which you've probably heard before, sign of completion, a finished work. So we would think about the resurrection where Jesus has finished his work. Now he sits at the right hand of God. At the right hand is also uh, a thing. Uh, It represents the place of authority and the place of honor. And so he sits at the right hand of God. So again, a very unique role that he is sitting on a throne beside God the Father. That's like, that's a big deal, a weird deal. That's a big deal. So this is what he's doing. And so now then... The Jews realize this unique ruler is just, he's gonna be something weird. And so by this time in history, they're using the son of David term. And so that's something you'll see in scripture because when people talk to Jesus, you know, Lord, uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so the people are beginning to connect the dots here. And so here's what's going on with this. Jesus recounts this and he asks them, you know, who's, 
whose son, uh, who, whose Messiah descend from? You know, like, you get that right. And they're like, well, yeah, he comes from David. And so Jesus is saying to them, okay, do you really understand what's going on here? And they would say, well, yeah, we understand. And Jesus is going back basically, why, in this review, like, do you really understand what's going on here? And, and if they were honest, they would say, okay, we, we, we don't. We really don't. We really don't get the whole thing. But, we, but it's a thing. We know it's a thing. We're doing the best we can to understand it. And so now Jesus, in a sense, is saying, he's saying, let me help you make sense of this. I, I want to make some sense for you. This is what's going on. Uh, so if he's not David's son only, or is he David's son only? Like, how did David process this? Because this doesn't make sense. If you think about it this way. Uh, let's just talk about dads here. Okay, so dad, let me, I'll be a, I'll be a dad for a moment. I am a dad, so this helps. Um, all right, so you wouldn't think of your son as being your Lord, right? I mean, we've already got a difference. Like if you were to ask me, okay, Jeff, there's you and your son. Who's, who's the bigger of the two? Who's the more important? Where's the authority lie? I'd be like, well, with me. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I love my son. I do, I totally love my son. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I haven't said this in here before, Paul. I'm saying that now. My son just got this really cool job. He did. So my son went to uh, tech school to work on uh, race cars, and he just got a job uh, with a NASCAR driver. And so uh, number 34, Michael McDowell, now my favorite driver. Uh, I didn't even follow NASCAR until about five weeks ago. So I'm, I'm all in now. <laughs> so I'm just keeping it real. So like my son's got this job. He's got this super cool job. He's around, like if you're in the NASCAR world, and not everybody is, if you're in the NASCAR world, he's around all the big people all the time. And he's on a first name basis with people that I was surprised about. Like I just, this whole thing. So he's got this whole world. So that that being said, and, and who is it? It's a good friend of mine who's been following my posts on Facebook. He told me recently, he said, I want you to know that your son is now my favorite Phil Pot. You are second. But uh, I, I get it. I get it. But, but, but here's the thing. Like, if you ask me, like, is, is, who, who's the bigger one here? Is it, you, is it you or your son? It's me. My son wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. It's got to be me, right? I am the Phil Pot, right? Now, my dad is still alive. So... He's really the fill pot, but you're like, so maybe I'm sub him and you can say he's more important, but my son is below me. And if he has a kid, he's even further down. So the idea is this. If I have a kid who has a kid, who has a kid, who has a kid, however long this stretches out, great, 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 fill pot. Who's more important, me or him? Me. That kid wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this line, right? So this is what Jesus is saying. David has a kid, 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 kid. How is David looking down the line at a great, 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 great and saying, that's going to be my Lord. Like, first of all, he's not even here when you're here. And what is God doing talking to that guy anyway? Like, how's this thing work out? How can he say? No, my Lord says to my Lord. Like, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense at all. And that's what he's saying to the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are going like, we totally get this. And as Jesus unpacks this, do you really understand it? Well, not, not really. Actually, no. It's, it's confusing, right? And that's like so many things in scripture for us. I know that things just don't make sense. But if you dig into them a bit, they do. So here's what we do know about Jesus. We can trace Jesus' lineage through Joseph and Mary. We can. Like in this scripture, you go to the New Testament, you will find a lot, two lines given of, of Jesus. And they're different because they're tracing different lines. One is Joseph, one is Mary. And if you follow them back, they both connect to King David. All right, so, which that's a family thing, but otherwise, other, that's him. That's all right, we'll let that go. So he ends up connected to David on both sides of the family tree. Absolutely, we know that's true. Jesus is a descendant of uh, David, but not just David. All right, now this very famous scene when Jesus is getting baptized and Matthew talks about it for us in Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three, verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I said, this is God speaking from the heavens. Like, that's my boy right there. That's my boy. Where everybody around would have been like, what? What's that? Now, not everybody heard the voice. It was, you know, it's a Bible thing. But uh, this whole idea of like, well, how can he be, how can he be descended from, how can he, God's son and David's. Like, that doesn't make sense. And so this is, that, this is that weird moment with intense theological implications where, we've, where we are reminded or learn that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. All right, it's what theologians would call the hypostatic union, right? You can look that up. That's a fun little discussion. Um, the idea that he's fully God, fully man. And that's why he could offer himself as a sacrifice for us. 
That's why you and I couldn't die for other people and save them. It's, that's why Jesus could do it. He was, he was perfect in every way, uh, and he was divine. And so he could give himself for us. Now, the apostle Paul did understand that. So the apostle Paul, as he writes in the book of Romans, this is what he says in Romans chapter one, verses one through four. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who has descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Paul puts it out there very plainly, like, listen, descended from man, we know he's of the line of David, but also we know of God himself. And so there's this weird way in which God is, uh, Jesus is both, or Messiah is both God and man. Really, uh, really neat thing here. So uh, then you get to verse, at the end of verse 37, I love this at the end of verse 37. And the great throng heard him gladly. So this is, here's what's great. So Jesus stops, asks the Pharisees, do you understand what's going on here? Yes, we understand it. Do you really understand it? No, we we really don't understand it. Now, when that's going on there, and they're wrestling with the implications of all that stuff, the crowd behind them, they're loving this. And I don't know how first century Jewish people would share their emotion and encouragement with each other. I don't know how that works. Like, if it was a crowd of us, this would be going down, and we would be in the back, we'd be doing our own commentary, we'd be laughing, we'd be elbowing each other. Now, if anybody looked at us, we'd hush. But in the meantime, while this is going on, we'd be like, this is fantastic. You know, now I'm glad we don't have TV. You know, like this would be, we'd be taking all this. In. So um, as you're sitting there watching this whole thing, they love it. Now, if Jesus had paused and turned to the people and said, do y'all like what you see in here? They'd have been like, this is awesome. We love, we love you putting down the most elite religious minds in the nation. I mean, these are the big dogs right here. And with a word, with a response, with a question, you shut them down. This is awesome. But I think if Jesus were to say, okay, do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> but they were like, oh, how are we? No, of course not. They don't even understand. How would we understand? And so this is the thing I'm reminded of often in scripture. So just because we read scripture and it doesn't seem to make sense to us in the moment, it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense. And, and let me just, I don't want to throw this out there as a Bible study moment. Like if you ever come across something in scripture and you're like, I just don't get what's going on here. Now, again, another plug for getting a good study Bible. And if you ever have a question about that, shoot an email to the church or ask one of the pastoral staff here. We'll be glad to tell you about a good study Bible. But, but if you ever have a struggle with that, then this would be the thing that would push you back to more study. And from time to time in our um, community groups ministry, we offer a study called hermeneutics. And it's about how to understand and apply the Bible And there's a way to go about that that will help make some of these passages more clear to you. Um, But there's a sense in which that's what Jesus is pausing to do right here in this moment uh, with the crowds who love what they're hearing, but they struggle to understand the meaning. So if I could say it this way, the simple meaning to this passage is there's more to Messiah than you understand. I think that's what Jesus is trying to say to them. There's more to Messiah than you understand. And so here's the thing I'm always wrestling with as I study scripture. Like when I'm reading stuff, there'll be times when I just acknowledge like this is truth, this is real, this is great, amen. But then I, I always, I almost always, almost, always pause and go, okay, is there something here for me? Like is there something the Lord would say, to, like if he showed up right now, is there something here he would say to me? And maybe he would say something like this. There's more to Christ than we expect or to personalize it. I think Jesus might say to me, Jeff, there's more to me than you currently understand. Now, I think that's something we can all get on board with, right? Like if Jesus could sit in front of you right now and go, you know, there's more to me and my plans for you than you currently understand. And we'd all say like, well, 100%. I totally, I totally believe that. I don't have any doubt in my mind about that. Uh, okay, so let's, let's now talk about that. What then, what are ways that that, that works itself out? So I, if I could say it this way, and it's a weird phrase maybe. He doesn't just want to be your savior, I would actually love to take like five minutes for y'all to talk about that. Right? <laughs> what, what does that mean? He doesn't just want to be your savior. So uh, uh, maybe I'll phrase it this way. So we understand the idea that Jesus is our savior. And maybe you've heard the phrase that Jesus is our Lord. So could he be your savior, but not your Lord? What do you think? <laughs> okay, so, cause I've, you know, I've heard some weird things before where people will be like, well, I know he's saved me. I know he's rescued me. I know Jesus is my savior. I'm just not sure he's, he's my Lord. I've, like, I've heard something like that before. And I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't think you can do that with Jesus. <laughs> it, it's a package deal. I'll be honest with you. He is either both or he's neither. 
right? But here's what people wrestle with. This idea that, that like he saves me, he rescues me, that's by grace through faith. But lordship has to do with me submitting my life to him in all of its many, many areas. And that's where maybe it gets complicated. So years ago, I was uh, with this uh, guy that was attending, and they still do, they're still part of our church. Um, and he was Jewish by history, but he did not believe in Jesus as Messiah. And, and after they attended here a while, he got to a point where he became convinced that Jesus was Messiah and he wanted to give his life to Christ. And so we prayed and he gave his life to the Lord. Now, subsequent to that, he, uh, he was involved in some things in his lifestyle that were not biblically appropriate. And so I came to him and just impolitely, we were having a conversation over lunch and I just said, hey, I, I just wanted to highlight something to you. You're living in a way that is not consistent with what God wants for his children. There's an area of your life you need to address and you need to change it. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, okay. He said, hold on. He said, let me get this straight. You told me that for me to find forgiveness and grace in Jesus Christ, like I, I didn't have to do anything. I just have to put my faith in him. I said, you're absolutely right. And he's like, but now you're telling me that now that I'm a Christian and I'm following him, now I have things I'm supposed to do. I said, yes, you're absolutely right. And he's, like, he's like, that doesn't seem to make sense. I was like, no, it does make sense. Okay, so here's how it makes sense. And this is the easiest way for me to explain it to anybody. So let's say I'm living in my house and there's an eight-year-old kid that runs up and down the block and he, he's crazy. He just, he's doing whatever he wants to do. He's a nut, you know, all this kind of thing. Like he's, I don't know whose kid this is, but like just stay off my lawn, all right? You know, I'm that guy now. Uh, you know, when you get into your 50s, you can do, like get off my lawn, kid, right? That, that's what we do. Um, uh, and I hope to get better at that as I age. And so this, uh, this guy, this kid, he runs around. I didn't matter. I don't even care what he does. I don't care where he lives. Just don't mess with my world. You just go out and do your own thing. All right, but let's say this. What if though I want to adopt, all right? And this kid is up for adoption. And I'm like, you know what? I'll adopt that kid. And he comes into my home. And, uh, and he says to me, you know, like, hey, thanks for adopting me. It's great. Uh, but I just want you to know I'm just going to go live my life however I want to live my life. And I'd be like, okay, time out. Like, that was cool when you were not my kid. Now you're in my family. My family has rules. And you're going to live life a certain kind of way. And the kids will be like, well, I don't, I don't know. That. Well, you in my family or you're not my family? There's, there's, it's a package deal. You came into my family, we do life a certain way. So this idea of I can be in the family, but not of the family, that doesn't work. God's got one plan. And so when I say he doesn't just want to be your savior, what I'm saying is this, he really wants you to be his family. He really wants you to be his kid. He really wants you to be uh, in, in, in such a way of submission that you live out the life that God would have his people live. So that when people see you, they know what family you're with. Oh, you're a Philpot kid. I get it. You know? Yeah, so in this sense, oh, you're a Christian. I get it. I can see it by the way you live. You, you live by the rules, the ways your dad teaches you to live. That's how you live. That's, that's what's going on here. So, um, and our hope is this too, because here's this other curious thing. Not only does he save you, rescue you, not only does he want to be your dad and govern the way you live and transform you completely inside and out, change the way you think of God, change the way God sees you, change the way uh, you see God, change the way you see yourself, change the way you see the world around you. He wants to do all that stuff. And then as you're working through all that, which by the way, that's a lot of stuff and you're working through that. But as you're working through that, then he says, okay, well, as you're doing all that, I don't want you to forget this. There are people all around you who need to hear about me. I need you to be involved actively, consistently telling them about me. You got to share the gospel with the people around you. And you're sitting there going, I can't even get my own life right. How am I supposed to be doing this? And God's like, hey, it's part of the deal. You're in the family. You're like, okay, I'll give it a shot. So this, this idea then that we bear this responsibility to communicate the good news. And our hope is to see as many follow the Lord as possible before it is too late for them. That's our, that's our heart. It's one of the reasons we put this cross out in the lobby. So we have this cross in the lobby, which we've talked about a good bit over the, the months. Uh, it's got these light bulbs on it. It's got these empty holes on it. And the thought is this, is that every time you have a chance to share the gospel with somebody, friend, family, neighbor, whoever, anytime you have a chance to share the gospel, no matter how they respond, the next time you come to church, just fill out a card up there that tells us about your experience and what you did, and then screw a light bulb in on the cross. And the light bulb just lets us know this, that the light has gone out into the community. That's what it means, that the light has gone out into the world in some kind of way. And that light is, it's two things. One, it's a celebratory moment. Lord, thank you that somebody got a chance to share the gospel. And two, it's a prayer request. Lord, whoever heard the gospel, may they respond in full and give, them, give themselves over to Christ. Like that's what, we're, that's what we're praying for. And so that's why we do that thing in the lobby and encourage you to do that. By the way, as a side note, I count the holes every week. I just, I just wanted to, maybe it's a pastor thing, but I just, I just, I just want to know that people are hearing the gospel. It's so encouraging to me. So hopefully uh, you guys are doing that. I'm doing that as well. So when I uh, share the gospel, I'll, I'll put a bulb in there as well. Uh, I do, we do have like a couple super evangelists here in the church, I'll be honest with you, who share the gospel a lot every week. And I've asked them to restrain from filling up all the holes, you know? So it's like, you should just do one for the week, you know, for you. But um, other than that. All right. 
So we want to see that. Now there's this proverb that Pastor Chris and I have talked about this proverb a lot. This proverb is Proverbs 24, 11. It says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. It's Proverbs 24, 11. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. And so as Chris and I have processed this, it seems like there's at least a couple of categories of people. So one of the categories of people who are caught up in a system of evil and darkness, and they, they just don't realize it, and it is guiding them to a point of death. Like, and, and for me, that would be the world system. Like, like this, this world system that would sell you on something that is just contrary to God's word. Like this idea. Uh, some people have this idea. Uh, people are basically good, if we will just continue to, to give to them, to bless them, to resource them, they will end up even better still, and then they'll turn back around, and they're going to help other people, right? So there's a system of life that kind of believes that. So therefore, you know, we, we don't condemn anybody. Uh, we don't judge anybody. Uh, we would never fight a war. We're not going to, uh, you know, whatever, it, all that kind of stuff. It, the problem is that it, this is not biblical. So the biblical point of view is this, and it's really simple. People are basically evil. They just, people are basically evil. Just have some kids. You know, so I, I have some kids and you know, it's like, I love my kids, but uh, there's, they've got me in them. And so they're just as bad as I would. Like there, there's just a basic evil in the world. It is natural and it has to be corrected, challenged, held back, this kind of thing. And there's a group of people that ca get caught up in this world system that is deceived in every way uh, about who they are and about how the world works and about God. They're deceived in every way and they're being led to death. And we're to intervene in that and try to try to let them know that there's another way. And so we share with them the gospel. Now there's another group that is staggering towards death. And the thing interesting to me about that phrasing, and I don't, I may be going deeper than the author intended, but this idea that, that like there's a group of people in this drunken stupor going through life in a way that is just detrimental to them in every way. And so it's like this, we come to them and we're pleading with them as they're making foolish choices. Do not do this. This is not in your best interest. God has another plan. You can do this another way. And it's like they are inebriated and they're, they're just kind of stumbling back and forth, but they're headed for a cliff. And so it's like we're walking beside them, like, don't do this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Like, there's another way. Jesus has another way. Please don't. God's got grace. Yeah. And then, they, then they're then they gone. And you're like, oh. And so Chris and I have talked about this, like, as we've seen people do this in their lives just over and over again, a number of them. It's just like, well, what do we do now? Just go to the next one. I mean, that's what we, like, that's the thing. And let me encourage you in this way. If you legitimately are trying to win people to Christ, it's just going to be that from time to time, you're not going to be able to convince people. The, the thing is, God has never told us that that was our job. We don't have to convince people. We don't save people. What we do is we testify. We talk about the goodness of God. We talk about the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And we realize, too, that whether they're being led by a world system or they're stumbling through foolish choices, we, too, were on one of those paths. And God rescued us. So there's always hope for somebody else. So we stay faithful and we proclaim the good news. Jesus is our savior, he is our Lord, and this is what he's called us to. And I'm, I think back too, to uh, Peter. So Peter was preaching at the time of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's church. Uh, and we read this scene in Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, we see this. This is part of Peter's sermon. Brothers, I, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend in the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is so funny to me because this is one of those where even the religious leaders of the land didn't understand it. And Peter uses it as like the heart of his message. Like he ends up with this. He's like, the Lord said to my Lord, like boom. And the people are like, I, I do you? And, and God's Holy Spirit opens their eyes and thousands respond to the good news of Christ. It's unbelievable. This beautiful thing. And I love this whole idea that, that David is, is trying to wrestle with. What does it mean that the Lord says to my Lord, this whole idea of what does lordship mean to David in this passage? And then Jesus asking the Pharisees, do you know what it meant when David said, the Lord says to my Lord, and they're wrestling with what does it mean, this use of Lord? And then I think it comes down to us. What does it mean when we call Jesus Lord? 
What does it mean when we call Jesus Lord? And I think the summary for me is this. That there's an aspect of salvation. I hope we've talked about that a lot in this church, about what it means to be truly saved. But this idea of lordship, this idea of Jesus' supreme authority over me, which is something we acknowledge, but I'm not sure it's always something we live. And so let's, let's just do this for a moment. Just bow your heads for just a second. Bow your heads for a moment. And just ask the Lord, is there any way, Lord, that I have not been acknowledging your supremacy? Is there any way in my life I have not been acknowledging your authority? Jesus, I know that we delight in salvation, a free gift of God. And Lord, I also know that we wrestle with rebellion, even those who call you Father. Jesus, as we often preface our words to you when we say, Lord Jesus, may it be, Jesus, that you would search us and reveal to us any way that we are rebellious. We acknowledge that those who love you are filled with your Holy Spirit, and so may it be, Holy Spirit of God, may you give us the strength to walk in submission to the authority of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen.